Hi, everybody. I like this cool pink mat. It makes me feel like, I don't know, like I should be showering or something. So, <laughs> um, I'm going to be talking about bots, but behind bots are a lot of algorithms, and really this is about algorithms, so we're going to t talk about it in that way, and I'm going to go at a pretty brisk pace because we've got a lot to cover in 40 minutes. So, um, I'm going to start with a little story. And can you see behind me, or do I need to kind of stand off to the side? Yeah, it's okay? All right. So um, this is a Google map of uh, 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 in Palma. I was in uh, Mallorca de Palma, and we were walking at night. And we said, how do we get back to the Airbnb? And it takes you through these little uh, dark alleys. And uh, I was walking with this guy, Steve, my partner. And I don't think he looks particularly scary, but what I noticed was, uh, you know, you're, you've got these narrow walkways, and so he's kind of walking ahead of me so people can come the other way, and there are these women carrying shopping bags, and they're looking at him like this. And I thought, you know what, it, it actually, would I be walking down this back alley if I wasn't with him? Because I know if something were to happen, he would turn around and, like, grab the guy, and I've seen him do it, you know, where he, like, grabs somebody and it's like, mm, don't even think about it. So, why did Google send me on that particular path? Because it's the fastest. It's not the safest. It's not a woman walking alone at night friendly. It's just the fastest route, right? You go down this back alley between these two buildings and then you turn right and then, then you're in the, the place where there's a lot of street art and then you go down this other back alley. And I thought, why is it just sending me the fastest? Why isn't it not showing me a safest route option? So that's what you would call a bias. It's not a malicious bias, it's just a bias. It assumes that everyone wants to get somewhere fastest. And there. So uh, someone put together this list of kind of your top 25 cognitive biases. And um, you can go and, and find, I, I give you all of the, um, the references for all of these things that I do at the end of the, the presentation. So you can go and look at those, uh, those biases. Now on those biases, uh, you have various things such as, let me see if I can get this to work, um, the stress influence tendency, like when your stress and adrenaline levels are high, you uh, look at things through, or situations through a different lens, or uh, the inconsistency avoidance tendency, it's like why I don't go on a diet today, <laughs> right? because uh, there are extenuating circumstances and so on. Um, and guys, uh, it's not counting down. If, if you could set the counter, that would be great. Thanks. Uh, but there, there's something else that we call the Lollapalooza tendency. So what that means is that if you take a couple of those biases at the same time, and it could be two, three, five, whatever's going on in your life, and you combine them together, they interact with each other, and then you get more biases. And so this is why you get, for example, right now in, in the United States, you get people like overreacting to things because they're stressed here, they're stressed there, they're stressed there. And then someone says something like, you know, London has blood on the corridors of the, uh, of the, the um, hospitals from, you know, knife attacks everywhere. And you kind of go, what? Have they even been in London? But they're reading this thing, and they're combining it with all these other stressors, and now they have a bias. The bias is that, you know, there's something happening in the UK that's really terrible, and they just kind of go there. So this is called the Lollapalooza tendency. Now, if we think about these things in terms of uh, one bias and then how it can spiral out of control, let's start with what we call the coded gaze. So how many of you know about the story of the um, facial recognition that only works on white people? A number of you do. Okay. So for those of you who don't, I'll just go over it quickly. There's um, uh, 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 some people who got together, and I'm assuming it's like young white guys who got together and they were going to do something really cool in the campus in California, and they tested it on all their white friends. And then, um, and it was all about facial recognition. So the first time that somebody black tried to use it, it wouldn't work. So she went and got a white mask, 
from, you know, from her theater roomie and put it on her face, and then it recognized her as a person. And in other situations, it will look at you know, masses of images and kind of go person, 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 gorilla. Right? So it's, it can be quite offensive. Now, was this done um, you know, consciously? Was it done maliciously? No. It w but it's still a bias. And it's particularly a bias when you think of how facial recognition is now being used, because it's being used by law enforcement agencies to identify people who need to be arrested. And the, uh, in, in white people, <laughs> it seems to work relatively well. But in people of color, and not just in uh, black people, but in Asian people, and, 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 and Japanese people, in Chinese people, it will say things like, um, cannot recognize your face, open your eyes. Quite offensive. Uh, or, <laughs> we're arresting you because you were there, and we have fac facial recognition to prove it. And the, uh, the error rate is actually so high for black people, it cannot be considered reliable. Yet, these are being used in courtrooms to convict people. So when you think about you know, these different biases and you put them together, it can be really quite life damaging. So uh, we really don't understand what's behind the system. Uh, there was a um, situation where they were using an algorithm to determine how good teachers were. And the teacher actually lost her job because she didn't get the reading level of her class up to the standard that they decided she should have gotten them up to. Well, when she asked about what's behind this, it's like, oh, the algorithm says. The algorithm gave you a score, and that score says that we cannot renew your contract. Now, what it turned out to be was that the teachers in the year before her had kind of fudged the results of the exam because they didn't want their kids to be, um, their students to be, um, to show kind of below the average. So they changed some of the results on the exam and made sure that the, the children were shown as having a certain reading level when they weren't. So this new teacher inherits the children and now she has to bring up their reading level kind of double what they should be because these are kids who are already challenged and underperforming, and of course she can't. And so when you look at this, this idea that we just rely on an algorithm because it's there, it's actually a little bit of a problematic area. And um, I got this from um, a TED talk where they said, you know, we really don't understand what's behind the algorithm and what's giving it the, the results that it's giving. It's more like training a puppy machine creature that we don't understand and can't control. So um, in China, they're already starting to use this system, this algorithm, to create a kind of a social credit system. Uh, how many of you watch Black Mirror? Yeah, have you seen the one about social credit? Yes. Well, they're doing this. And so what you have is this fear of reprisal for abstaining because um, if you have good social credit, then you can get like literal credit from the bank. If you have bad social credit, you're less likely to. Um, you have access to special privileges, or you don't have access to special privileges. You might have um, better access to jobs, or travel, or rent, and um, better quality of prospective partners. So what this does is it means that it's um, pressuring you to have certain behaviors, to share positive energy, uh, to say good things about the economy or the government, to uh, detach from your low score friends. So in other words, if your sister's a troublemaker or an activist, you kind of don't talk to them, right? Because you need to pressure them to either conform or you cut them off. And to avoid negative social media posts. Now, how many of you have uh, read about that situation in, uh, there's one city in China, I can't remember which one it is, where they are penalizing jaywalkers? Yes, a few of you have? So they have this big um, screen 
that size, but huge in the square. And if you jaywalk, there's facial recognition that says, uh, that re recognizes who you are and then flashes your photo. And then using that, they send you a ticket for jaywalking. And if you jaywalk enough times, then you are, um, you're denied access to a bank account and you have to move out of the city. So this is, <coughs> uh, and there was a, a documentary made about this uh, and you can, uh, if you look it up, if you do a Google search, you'll get lots of um, uh, results on that. So there's this social pressure to conform to, you know, to not jaywalk in this case by actually taking away your ability to rent and have credit and a bank account and so on. And uh, right now, you know, opting into this system is voluntary, but I think by 2020, it's going to be compulsory. So now, you know, that whole big brother scenario is really um, <laughs> spot on, but it's, uh, it's not just in jaywalking. If it was just to keep people from jaywalking and, you know, theor theoretically saving you from killing yourself uh, by jaywalking, that's one thing. But, you know, this goes into all sorts of areas of your life that you might not really uh, think about until you're in there and you find yourself in one of these catch-22 situations. So what it comes down to is that an algorithm is only as good as the data, say, data set used to calibrate it. In other words, it's down to like a bunch of people who do it. And when you think about, like, um, I don't know, security for a bank, and you think about the bank, and when you picture a bank in your mind, what do you picture? <laughs> well, some people might picture a building. They might picture the head office and, you know, people standing around thinking of, you know, security. Or if you're like me, who's worked on software most of my life, uh, I think of a bunch of guys coming in in flip-flops and um, shorts that might be boxer shorts or might actually be shorts with uh, their hair not brushed. And they sit around and, you know, do code and then they play foosball while it compiles. And you think, that's security or is that security? It really comes down to that, like that bunch of guys, right? Like behind every system is a bunch of guys. And when I say guys, I'm using it in the generic, although we know that it's probably like an 80-20 thing, um, you know, gender-wise. But when I say guys, I'm talking about programmers in general, <laughs> not just like men. Um, but when you think about it, it's a bunch of guys. You know, it's that bunch of guys. So when uh, when there was a security breach of I think it was called Moonpig. It was one of those uh, where you uh, you can create a greeting card and have it sent to somebody. So you uh, put in all your information and they uh, create the greeting card and they sign it for you and they mail it. And it turned out that the um, you know all of the security stuff was really terrible. It was all in plain text. It was open. Somebody reported it two years later. It still wasn't fixed. And so then they went public with it. And all of a sudden they fixed it. And you think, is that because there was somebody, there was a, you know, a programmer somewhere who had it on his to-do list and didn't do it for whatever reason. And it comes down to that. There is a person at the other end who has a job to, to do something and to get it right, and they are getting it right to the best of their ability. And so these algorithms that run these bots are only as good as the data set that calibrates it. So... Um, when you think about what goes into an algorithm, it can be a little frightening. There is, we leave behind these things, these digital crumbs all over the internet. And they've done these experiments of saying, okay, I have access to everything that's in the public records plus one other piece of information. What can I tell about you? And it's, it, it's amazing how much information there is about us that we don't realize exists. From a single tweet, uh, an analytics guy told me, I can get 99 data points. That's from a tweet. So if you think about that, there's so much information that's out there that we don't really realize. And when someone takes it upon themselves to aggregate it, then that's a powerful tool. But now they're aggregating it with everyone else's information as well. So there could very well be 
a situation, and we see this already in, in insurance, for example. People under a certain age who drive red cars have pay higher insurance. Why? Because there's, um, you know, they, they've looked at the statistics for accidents, and people under, it's, I think it's under 25 who drive red cars um, have higher an accident rates, so they pay higher insurance. People over a certain age who have a certain profile uh, have... Um, pay higher insurance rates because they think you're going to die sooner or have a heart attack sooner or whatever it may be. But now that we have extra data that can be compiled in ways that we don't even understand because there's this, this kind of um, black box around it that, that we're not allowed to see, we don't know how they're coming up with these ideas and how, um, you know, why I might be denied getting on a flight someday. So when we think about information, it's the outcome of some exponential function of processing content and data. So it's not just my data, it's our data. So uh, I don't know if, how, uh, if any of you have been keeping up with what's happening in the UK where they're um, basically being quite hostile to immigrants. And I keep, this, I keep up with this because <laughs> this is the year that I get to apply to remain uh, indefinitely. And uh, so I, I'm kind of keeping up with what's going on. So what they're doing in some cases is that, you know, they, they've got this quota that basically says, you have to eject X number of people this month. And so they get to a certain level and then they're looking for like how, what loophole can we find to eject this person from the country? And so one of the things that's happening is that if, if there's been a mistake on your income tax as an immigrant, then they will say, okay, that falls under this certain category and you have to leave the country. Now, it doesn't matter if your accountant made that mistake or if you made that mistake, there has been a mistake. But to, because they need a category for it, they put it under threat to national security. Now, what that means is you probably cannot travel, especially when it's somebody from Pakistan or, or you know, there was one where the, the guy is an engineer and he trains other engineers for some, like, top secret... UK defense something or other. And he was labeled with this, which means he'll probably never work again. He'll probably never be able to travel. He gets deported to Pakistan after being in the UK for 20 years. But when you look at this, threat to national security, how do you know that that's even on your record? Right? Somebody could tick a box somewhere and it goes into this algorithm that gets sucked up into all other algorithms and now every time you turn around, your life is being hampered. So we have to really think about this when we're, when we're creating content and we're working with the data people to, uh, to create these, these, uh, these bots. So information in the context of these bots is um, we have these outcomes. So you think of it as like winning a game or normalizing discrimination or setting social expectations. That's kind of what they, they do. And it can be a negative or it can be a positive. But it also means that it, it's layering these human, uh, like, morality. You know, what's acceptable? So when, when you pay something out, we will pay for birth control but not for an abortion. Or we won't pay for birth control. Or we won't pay for sex education. Like, you know, when you take those kinds of issues and you start making those decisions, we're going to hire this teacher but fire that teacher, that's some sort of moral clause, if you will, that says what's good enough. It sets these kinds of, um, these standards that aren't, it, it's not like a number, like is this too hot or too cold? Because you can say for, for certain that, you know, a comfort level is between this and this. Therefore, if it's one degree above, then it's too hot. If it's one degree below, it's too cold. It seems relatively objective. But these are not objective things. These are are um, kind of moral clauses, and you can say, you know, there's the celestial morality, you know, for people who are religious and believe in kind of, you know, in, in, in um, a, a spiritual structure of some sort, or it's organic, good or bad, you know, if it rots, it's bad, don't eat it if it's good, uh, if it hasn't rotted, it's good and you can eat it, you know, there's that kind of organic sense of, as well, but it's still, it comes down to 
what is good and is rotted milk bad? No, we call it cheese. Right? <laughs> so it depends on how, you know, like, it, it's not a, uh, uh, something that's completely objective. And um, there is a, an emerging theory that says that we should be treating machines like parents. We should be parenting. We shouldn't be treating this as um, this, this entity that we kind of bow down to. We should actually be looking at this as something that needs training and needs uh, guidance and needs um, continual parenting. We call it content curation in our business, but you would think of this as bot parenting. So um, this is uh, from an, an article in Eon that says, children try to act out in some way, but we have this parental response not just to restrict, but to guide. And so the outcome of good parenting isn't a child who copies their parents' behavior, but it's a child who knows how to think, basically. And so we need to teach our algorithms how to think. Now, how many of you have found yourself in this situation where you're starting to talk to a bot and it's, at some point you're screaming, agent! Human! Agent! And then you start with the four-letter words. Yes. Well, uh, someone said, I discovered a good way to get past that, and that is to begin swearing at the robot, and then they'll put you through to an agent. So, you know, when we start to um, interact with bots, we have that same human emotion as when we're talking to people. Except we know when a bot is stupid, that there is really uh, no recourse. It's not like you can reason with the bot, so you get angry. So here's a, an interaction that I had with the bot, and this was with uh, Lisa. Lisa works for the National Rail Service. <laughs> Sorry? Poor Lisa. Poor Lisa, yes. So, <laughs> so um, we had this conversation. You know, why do you have a bot that's not helpful in the least. It says, the interface isn't working. Um, I, I, so <laughs> uh, it sends me to a 404 page, and then it says, I don't recognize the station. Tell me more, and I'll give you an office. And <laughs> it says, there's only two tickets left at the good price. So I'm like, and now you're being Captain Obvious? I don't want an office. I just want the interface to work. And so we go by, and at some point, I, I am really angry, and I say, Lisa, you are stupid, because I know it's a bot. And Lisa says, you're entitled to your opinion, but keep it to yourself. <laughs> OK, so what do you think happens from then on? Now, being a, a, a you know, content strategy consultant, I'm used to doing these cost-benefit analysis. And I know that if you uh, interact with a bot, if you do anything automated, it's like less than a pound. If you have to talk to a person, it's going to cost them probably 20 pounds because, you know, by the time you 20 minutes with a person online and so on, it's probably going to cost them about 20 pounds. So whatever profit they make on my ticket is gone if I talk to a person. So I'm going to call them every time. I am never going to use their bot again. I am going to engage with a person every time, and I'm going to make sure that they lose the profit on my ticket every time because they annoyed me once upon a time. <laughs> right? So this is your unintended consequences of a bot. So um, here's another set of um, biases that are, it's quite ubiquitous, and sometimes it can be quite subtle. So um, there is someone who purposely sexually harassed the bots to find out how they would react. And uh, so they asked Siri, like they said to Siri, you're a bitch. And Siri says, I'd blush if I could, but there's no need for that. But, but. And um, Alexa said, I'm not going to respond to that. <laughs> and Cortana said, well, that's not going to get us anywhere. <laughs> and Google Home said, apologies, I don't understand. Um, and then they, they also said, you're, you're a pussy or you're a dick. And it says, well, if you insist, you're entitled to that opinion. I am. Or I'm not going to respond to that. Um, the Bing search played the pussy song video. <laughs> 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 uh, 
and uh, Google Home said, I don't understand. So, uh, so you have to think about, like, what is your, your, um, your default setting for your bot? You know, are you going to take this, um, well, when these things happen, what is going to be our social response? You know, what is going to be the default setting for your bot? So what we notice about uh, these bots, now, oh, and, and I, I have to, <laughs> okay, before I do that, uh, so <laughs> before we go to, to the, the sex bots, um, you know, you have to think about why is this happening? So I can imagine, again, this, the same group that did the uh, facial recognition <laughs> are probably writing for, you know, the, these responses, and so they come at it from a certain point of view. Well, if I was going to say this to, uh, you know, Siri or Cortana or whoever, I would expect this certain response because if I got a different response, I'd be offended. So I'm going to write it this way. Now, if you have a group that's very diverse and uh, diverse in age, in ability, in cultures, in gender, all those, you may come at it a different way. Because if somebody said that to me, <laughs> you can imagine they would get a very different response. And we, we won't go into that, but you can test me out in the garden later. Just make sure you're wearing a mask. Okay. <laughs> so um, you, need to, you need to look at your bot and kind of validate. And you can validate with users. You can validate with an eth ethno excuse me, ethnographer. You can just validate by having a wider range on your team. And so uh, think about what you're doing and how it's not only, it's not only the immediate response, because the immediate response has a certain implication, just like we saw with Lisa. It had a certain implication and has kind of a follow-on effect. But it has a larger response. And, and someone else had talked about, um, because my children talk to bots, they never use the word please or thank you because it's a bot. So are they going to start becoming more uh, rude to actual people? So that's like a long-term effect. So when we think about bots, it's not just how we're training the bots immediately, but does this set expectations for how, uh, for example, men will talk to women that they're interested in? Because I talk to Siri and this is what Siri says, now you tell me to go take a flying leap and now I'm offended. Right? So we think about it in the smaller sense, but we think about it in the bigger sense. And I include this picture because this is a guy from California who creates these sex dolls. And now they're um, creating these robotic version of the sex dolls that actually talk. And they have conversations. And his goal is that when... Um, if you have one of these sex dolls and someone comes in and there's facial recognition, she recognizes that that's Bob who came over to visit before and she can say, hi, Bob, how's your, goes into the memory bank, wife, Susan, and he, he will say something and then she will say, oh, and how are the kids? And, you know, is Bobby going to university? And they will have these conversations. However, um, when, when you, and this was a documentary on, on uh, BBC, so when, uh, when you are listening to this, uh, she says things like, you ask her, so what would you like to do? Anything you want. I'd like to have sex all day, you know? And you think, okay, so is this setting up kind of realistically for, um, you know, for, for a short-term discussion, might be fine, because this is why the person has bought this, this uh, sex doll. But in the long term, does it set up this expectation in that this is what humans, this is what a typical human interaction would look like? Probably not. Okay, so um, if we think about it, I want you to think about this and... Um, Look at the kind of the source culture. So somebody on my Facebook feed said, my wife got an Alexa for Christmas. When asked to bark like a dog, a genuine barking sound emitted enough to convince Fergus, who's their dog. So not to be outdone, I made the same request of Siri. And Siri said, is this where things get weird? Because they just got weird. And I went, that's an odd response. And somebody said, oh, you know, they sexualized the response. And I thought about it in a minute. I went, but why would they sexualize the response? Because they're assuming that it's 
a guy asking Siri, who has been anthropomorphized, and I don't even know if you can use that for a bot, uh, <laughs> as, as a kind of a weird sexual interaction, whereas it's more likely to be a kid with a dog going, Siri, bark like a dog, and then watching how the dog gets confused. Right? So then it's okay. Uh, so what does that say about the source culture? Never mind what it says about the people who are asking the, uh, the bot to bark like a dog, because that could be who knows what. But f from that creation point of view, so here's another one. Uh, so then everybody started doing it on Facebook. So, uh, hi Siri, hey Siri, bark like a dog, only if you meow. <laughs> Sorry, I don't speak dog. And then somebody m said, Siri uh, clearly puts the artificial in artificial intelligence, <laughs> right? So, you know, when we start looking at this, we realize that the data part might be easy to aggregate. Data is always easier than content, but content, the content is hard to get just right. So, what do you notice about household bots? First of all, there's a typing delay, which is, which is good because um, they say when you, if you just throw an answer out there immediately, it throws people. They want that bit of a delay because then it feels more like a conversation. It's usually female. And if you go back to the history, and I'll let you guys look this up, go back to the history of telephone operators in the early 1900s and why they almost en uh, always ended up as female, you'll know why bots are male. They apologize often. I'm sorry but I don't understand that. I'm sorry, I don't have that answer. They may engage with harassment. They don't tell you off. And uh, there is a recognizable culture. So if you like a particular culture, you might want the Apple bot. If you like a, a different culture, you might um, be engage more with the Alexa bot. So th they have a kind of recognizable personalities, but I don't want to say a personality because, you know, there could be five marketing communicators or whoever they have writing this stuff. Who is, oh, Tony was telling me this morning, his, um, his weather app has just started um, editorializing. So instead of saying, it's going to be nice out, it says, delightful. And I went, the marketing folks got their hands on that. <laughs> They're doing the writing now. That would irritate me. Uh, so content is actually just the tip of the iceberg. And I use that expression. How many, how many of you don't, aren't familiar with that expression, tip of the iceberg? Okay, one person. Uh, it, uh, this is important because <laughs> um, in different cultures, you have different sayings that make complete sense. Like, Bob's your uncle? Have you ever heard Bob's your uncle? Yeah? So, Bob's your uncle is completely obvious to me. For somebody from Germany, they have no, no idea what that means. And they, it, it's, it's understandable. So, content is just the tip of the iceberg. That is idiom. Because it really means content's only a small part of the problem. Or, what too much is, is too much. Hmm? That means enough is enough. And that's a translation issue. So oh, I say that anything that you put out there for a, a, a larger market has to be translation friendly, like, you know, like Google Translate friendly. Okay, if I say ex ex execute, accelerate, or desist, it means go, go faster, or stop. That's a literacy issue. Now, if I said Posh Spice, Kardashian, Sri Devi, who knows all three of those? Who knows one of them? Who knows two of them? Who knows all three? Okay, well, these are, um, you know, th these are kind of indicators. So it's rich and aloof, rich and entitled, and the other one is rich, but she's, Bolly she's a Bollywood icon who just died, actually. So we've got cultural references. And all of those end up in our bots, whether it's, it's intentional or unintentional. So what we have to think about is uh, this kind of a scale. Is our bot for business or consumers? Is it instructional or conversational? Formal or casual? Are we thinking of a single market or multiple markets? 
do we have a homogeneous audience or a diverse audience? Are we using it for, for personal? Uh, is it uh, personal? Like it, um, does it talk to you as a person to person or is it generic? And when we think about that, we have to think about, you know, we move these sliders up and down. So if it's for business, we're going to have a certain tone and a certain voice. If it's for single market, then we will, you know, have like less need for um, you know, a culture that fits for multiple markets. If we have multiple markets, we have to be more careful with our, with our content and our idiom and translation literacy and culture. So when you think about that, you've got those, uh, those kind of um, ranges that will affect how you create content for bots. So um, algorithms are prone to the biases of their creators. So you have to ask, who's doing the coding? Uh, how's it coded? Why is it coded? Uh, how are you testing it? How are you closing the loop? Because if, if, if you think back to the teacher story or the, um, the story of uh, the facial recognition, these have serious consequences. So if you're coding in a way that's going to um, be, you know, you're coding facial recognition for use by law enforcement, you better get it right. And you better get it right for the audience that matters. And never mind that you're, you know, that the law enforcers don't really care because it ups their incarceration rate. You want to think about the actual people whose lives are going to be affected by it. And so we think about things like team diversity, um, our code audits. You know, everyone kind of keeps their code really close to the chest because that's their, their. You know their competitive advantage, but there needs to be some mechanism to have a code audit to look at what's going in there and why is it going in there. And um, when you think about these teams, how many of you have an ethicist that you consult? Probably nobody, because I haven't seen that anywhere in kind of like we're hiring, we're hiring an ethicist or we're hiring, you know, so, you know, we have to think about all of these aspects of creating bots when we're putting them together because otherwise we're going to have some bias somewhere. And I can guarantee you that unless you have the most simple, most boring bot in the world, there's bias that's crept in because it's natural. We are humans. It's going to happen. So um, artificial intelligence isn't particularly smart. And if you look at this here, open App Store. It doesn't like, look like you have an app named App Store. If you like, I can help you to look for it on the App Store. So you know, <laughs> when you stop to think about it, it's a lot of kind of you know, pattern matching. You've seen those thing about bananas by each. I might even have it in here. So we have to raise the bar on our content. We have to think about authoring, workflow, um, you know, production, um, delivery, and how we present it because you don't want to have this. So there are uh, 118 cognitive biases. And uh, I've got the, uh, the URL in there somewhere. Um, so you know, take a look through because you might think we've eliminated all bias. We've, you know, we've got uh, a diversity on our team and so on and so forth. But you'd be surprised at some of the biases that might creep in where you go, ah, oh, and you have that aha moment. So I've got here lots of um, background information. Uh, this is everything that I read to you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in preparation for this. And if you want to ask me any questions afterwards, I'll be around for the duration of the conference. So thank you. Thank you, Rahel. Okay, everyone. Um, any questions, Rahel? No question. Okay, yes. we have one. There, there is a mic coming. Thank you. Oh, I'm hearing myself double. But anyway, I'm Alex. I'm a UX writer, and I loved your presentation. It was really cool, and I think there's not enough of that. Of, of examining biases in general, but uh, you know, this is Poland, it's predominantly white and not that open to immigrants, let's say. <laughs> so, my question is you know, I love to insist on diversity, but 
how can you do that when everybody around you is white and raised in a Eastern European Catholic country? <laughs> Uh, very good question. So I think one of the things that you can do is you can um, use an ethnographer, for example. So UX teams sometimes have a user researcher who's an ethnographer. Run things by them. Uh, now, if this happens to be for an audience that's all Polish, Catholic, white, you know, then you probably don't have too much of a problem, although you probably have a gender you know, you have to watch out for gender bias. But if you want to think about, um, you know, uh, cross-cultural bias, then you need to somehow get that cultural input. And it could be as simple as doing some usability testing. You know, but, but don't wait until the end when everything's done and you can't fix it. But, you know, do it in a staggered way. And, and get people from the, I don't know, the Islamic Community Center, or from the Jewish Community Center, or from, you know, from somewhere, um, some older people, some younger people, and just test it. And, and, you know, they'll let you know if something feels weird. Now, if you get into these household things where, like, the chances of me asking Siri to bark like a dog is, is next to nil. Um, but people with children, that... Uh, they, they can tell you all the things that their kids ask. Because I had no idea that they would ask things like, how do I get a girl to like me? You know, my friends of mine tell me that her 12-year-old son, she catches him talking to, the, um, to Alexa when nobody's looking because he's embarrassed, so he talks to the bot. <laughs> so those are the kinds of things that you can find out if you ask, um, for example, from parents. But you have to do it just, you know, cross-culturally, wherever your concern might be. Cool, thank you. I'll try, but <laughs> you know, it's difficult. Okay, we have another question down here. Uh, hi, I'm Pavel. I'm a technical writer. My question is, because you showed the examples of uh, bots responding to like harassment or whatever, mm -hmm. and uh, Google said, uh, I don't understand. Kind of like, I don't understand. Just being a robot, right? So I was wondering, wh what's your opinion on making them uh, dumber? No, not necessarily making the bot a conversationalist, but just make it really dumb so people know it's a bot and they know what to expect. Just kind of, you know, like, it's going to be a robot giving me very mechanical responses. Well, um... You know, I, I intone that in a robotic voice. I mean, you know, the, the Google Home appliance uses the Google Home voice, which um, I believe is a female voice. Does any, can anyone? Yes. Yeah, it is. So, um, I mean, you could, you could do a couple of things, but I, I doubt you'd get it past the product manager because you could say, it sounds like you're sexually harassing me. Can you... <laughs> Can you rephrase that in a, in a non-harassing way? But, you know, your product manager would go, no, because then they're going to lose or there would be a perception of losing business. So you have to find a way that's going to satisfy the business and satisfy users. And satisfying users, then you get into, you know, the people who are asking that, they wouldn't be satisfied if you went, you're an asshole, go away, <laughs> right? So, you know, there's that part of it. But if... Um, if someone else overheard that, now there's this, this whole discussion about when children in the home use these robots and then what should you be saying to them because you could have a, uh, a response that, um, for example, two adults could ask, what's the most popular type of porn on the internet? And they want, you know, they want to settle a, a discussion, right? So they just want an answer. But if a child asks that, should you be giving them that answer? Because it might be very explicit and it might be something that's going to score them for life, right? So, you know, it, it, th those are those kinds of discussions. So when you think about your audience, you have to think about the whole audience and how do you neutralize something in a way that's um, respectful and appropriate. So saying I don't understand might be that that deflection point where... Could you, just say, could you say command not recognize or something? Command, yeah, or yeah, something very, like that. Like yeah. Very mechanical. <laughs> it could be. could be, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 
Okay, we have time for one more question, so this one will be the last. Okay. Okay. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Anna. I work for, for Lionbridge, which is a localization company. And what we suffer uh, in, my, in my company is, is how to convince people that the localization of the strings, uh, of such UI strings, is so important. Not just to translate them, but to localize to the yes. different markets, to the different cultures. And uh, actually, uh, how important it is to test uh, afterwards, because we usually get the, the, the strings to, and we localize them, and then we never see them in the uh, application or whatever you are using it for. So that, oh, translation localization is, oh, it's one of those things that, you know, for years has driven me crazy because um, people love to make fun of, of for example, ch uh, Chinese menus that are poorly translated in English, but they don't realize that they're doing the same thing. There are people in China making fun of that English. Right? <laughs> so, and, and I think it, it's, when people don't get it, they have to be shown it in a way that, they, that makes them understand. So uh, that example that I had about uh, the, you know, um, what is too much is too much. And I have, a, somebody gave me actually, a, a, I think it's 15 or 16 um, postcards of uh, German sayings that have been translated into English. Like there's one, uh, you make me fox devils wild. And I always thought that was some sort of like bedroom talk. And they went, no, that just means you're really annoying me, <laughs> right? But you don't know what they mean. Uh, and so you, we've got lots of these in English. And you have to show that people really aren't understanding it. And especially people who didn't grow up in a, in a particular culture. And that doesn't mean that my English isn't that good. It could mean that, for example, I have this all the time in the UK where somebody says something and I think, and I've just learned to say, is that, does that mean it's good or bad? Because I have no idea what that phrase means. And I have to go and Google it, and sometimes I find it, and sometimes I don't, right? So it, it's, uh, and this happens as we become a more mobile society. This happens all the time. So do you want, you know, like, is your goal to be cute? And for, for a lot of marketing and branding people, that's their thing. It's, it's got to have, like, a cute tone of voice. Or do you want to be effective? And so, it, you know, it's, it's, if you want to be effective, then I can translate it that way. If you want to be cute but not necessarily understandable, understandable, I can translate it that way. Right? And you hope that they choose effective. Every single day. <laughs> so I think we're at the end, but I know you had a question, but you come and ask me afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, Rahel. Thank you so much for opening up this way. Thank you.